Hello, welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester, I am the Director of Public Programs here, and I'm pleased to introduce tonight's Hammer Forum on the rising tide of progressive religious movements with Peter Larman and Sarah Posner, and moderated by Ian Masters. Um, on to tonight's program. The Hammer Forum is a series of public discussions about current social and political issues, and it's made possible with the generous support of Andy and Branya Galef. Tonight's forum is a look at what counterweights there are in progressive religious circles to right-wing religious conservatives. Why would there be a disparity in activism between the religious right and the religious left when they all worship the same God? Ian is a BBC-trained broadcast journalist who has covered national security affairs for over 25 years on public radio. He's the host of the daily briefing on Mondays through Thursdays at 5 p.m., as well as background briefing on Sundays at 11 a.m., all on KPFK 90.7 FM. Ian has been a senior fellow at UCLA's Center for Strategic and International Affairs and the UCLA Center for International Relations, and was a consultant to the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. So please join me in welcoming Ian Masters. Thank you, Claudia, and all of you for coming tonight to explore why it is that in our two-party political system that we have the party of the right, the Republicans, whose policies and political philosophy appear to be at odds with the spirit, if not the letter of the New Testament, yet they've managed to wrap themselves in the flag, cloak themselves in family values, and claim the Bible. While the party of the left, the, de the Democrats, whose policies and platforms seem much closer to the teachings of the prophet Jesus, are always playing catch up with patriotism, on the defensive about family values, and are either leery of the Bible or apologetically quoting from it. It would appear we have a muted and ambivalent New Testament party and a vocal Old Testament party, perhaps in the same way that Republicans trip over themselves in primary campaigns to proclaim that they are proud conservatives, even severe conservatives, as Mitt Romney declared, while on the other side, the Democrats never seem to stand up and say they are proud liberals or progressives. Apparently, on the left, we have an identity crisis, not to mention an energy deficit. The cognitive science scientist at Berkeley, George Lakoff, describes this difference as the stern authoritarian daddy party versus the yielding communitarian mummy party. And the numbers bear that out, with over 60% of American men voting Republican and over 60% of American women voting Democrat. The lead editorial in today's New York Times is headlined, Mr. Ryan's Faith-Based Budget. And in it, we learn that the Republican budget for 2015 proposes lowering the top tax rate from the current 39.6% to 25% while raising taxes on middle-class families by an average of $2,000. On the other hand, the Bible says that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. However, that is not something you will hear in America's most successful megachurch from the Reverend Osteen, who preaches the prosperity gospel. God doesn't want you to be a whiner. God wants you to be a winner. <laughs> a winner, which the telegenic televangelist certainly is, given that thieves recently broke into his office and took over $600,000, which was the take from just one Sunday's collection plate. And if you watch The 700 Club or Pat Robinson and their legions of imitators on TV, it is difficult not to conclude that religion in America is a front for right-wing politics. Indeed, Pat Robinson once ran for president as a Republican and Rupert Murdoch voted for him. Need I say more? <laughs> but in searching for an equivalent on the American religious left, you will not find anyone with fame or fortune, which incidentally the prophet Jesus eschewed, but you might find Sister Simone Campbell of Nuns on the Bus fame, who challenged her fellow Catholic Paul Ryan to explain how his advertised Catholic faith comports with his worship of the atheist Ayn Rand. Rand proselytized that greed is a virtue and charity a sin, while the other guy, who we'll call JC for short, who kissed lepers, prayed with hookers rather than engaged their services, did not celebrate capital punishment, carry an assault rifle or hate gays and lesbians, and shake down poor people for money on TV, did exactly the opposite. Well, somehow his message got lost. 
buried with the Beatitudes under the weight of Leviticus and piles of pieces of silver. So as we begin our search for the American left, we are left to wonder how doctrine translates into faith. How did the message get lost in translation and what happened to the legions of Christian soldiers who fought in the great moral and religious crusades to end slavery, establish women's rights, bring about civil rights and defend human rights? Where are they today? And why is it that the opponents of all of the above, the conservatives, have been able to stigmatize the liberals and progressives as dreamers when the left did the heavy lifting while the right just said no? And why are the liberals and progressives who achieved these great victories so defensive about standing up for what they believe in? Meanwhile, the results of the right-wing activism and policies and programs are on full display with a succession of Republican electoral successes leading to a conservative Supreme Court who just again ruled in favor of the moneyed few. And pundits and political analysts are telling us that plutocrats are pouring money into the upcoming election and are likely to succeed in capturing the Senate in November, in large part because the left will not be motivated to vote. So as we come to terms with this new Gilded Age, perhaps there is a lesson from the previous Gilded Age when the candidate of the plutocrats, McKinley, who outspent the Democrats 200 to 1, barely won against a candidate of the religious left, Williams Jennings Bryan, a candidate who predicted that the greatest challenge of the coming 20th century would be to protect the God-made man from the man-made God, the corporation. Back then, there was a populist movement of the rural and urban poor on the left before there was a religious right, before the televangelists had the media megaphone. But since, since we have our ebbs and flows between plutocracy and democracy, and today the plutocrats appear to own the courts and are buying the Congress, that does not mean that democracy will not live to see another day. And if American history is any guide, all ye faithful will come and the religious left will rise again. Peter Larman will speak first, followed by Sarah Posner, then we'll have a conversation, followed by extensive Q&A. Peter Larman was ordained by the United Church of Christ in 1993, and in January of 2014, he concluded 10 years of service as Executive Director of Progressive Christians Uniting, a network of individuals and congregations in Southern California uh, concerned with public justice who formed an interfaith initiative against racialized mass incarceration called Justice Not Jails. Prior to joining the ministry, Reverend Larman spent 20 years as a community organizer and a communication specialist with the American Federation of Teachers and the United Auto Workers. In 2009, the Yale Divinity School honored him with the William Sloan Coffin Peace and Justice Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Larman. Thank you, Ian, and I want to say how delighted I am to be here, and in particular, how delighted I am to uh, share this exchange with my good friend, Sarah Posner, on a chilly evening in Southern California. Uh, Ian has uh, given you better than I can kind of the framing around this uh, issue, and I want to go a little bit more deeply into some uh, elements of it, and I want to uh, I want our evening together to be as interactive as possible. So I will uh, hew to a, a, a very few points and uh, underscore them, and then uh, we all can engage together. Um, I want to, in thinking about the past of the uh, religious left in the United States, I want to reprise its positive roles, but also problematize its uh, deficiencies in the past. So I think all of you are historically aware to know that the sort of big, the obvious big moments when religion played a very uh, positive, unmistakably positive uh, role in civic life were uh, uh, the abolitionist movement, uh, the uh, strong opposition to uh, the brutality of the growing industrial system in the, in the old Gilded Age, uh, opposition to sweatshops and child labor, uh, the very serious and strong uh, involvement of the religious community in the progressive era that uh, gave us the loathed Federal Reserve System and, and uh, many other significant reforms in the early 20th century. The mid to late 20th century work 
in civil rights, which was uh, interfaith and interracial. Uh, the work done around the nuclear disarmament uh, issue, uh, fighting and finally defeating apartheid, and resisting uh, Reagan's dirty wars in Central America. Those were sort of the greatest hits of progressive uh, religion in the United States. Um, I would say in relation to that, uh, that the, what we think of as the tepid character of the religious left now uh, has to do with uh, a couple of factors. One, one without question uh, was the kind of sabotaging of the most vital elements and I'm thinking now from my own frame, mainly in, on the uh, Christian side, the sabotaging of the most vital elements, the, the people, for example, who were opposed uh, and, and uh, very actively opposed to the Contra War, uh, by an organized effort to undercut them, uh, called the Institute for Religion and Democracy, that was funded by some right-wing people, and that basically made the case uh, that the denominational leadership and the, and the activist uh, clergy had betrayed the actual nature of the religious inheritance, that they were importing left secular ideology and abandoning uh, uh, commonly accepted I, uh, uh, religious uh, doctrine. And that was very, very effective in terms of cutting off money to some of these denominational bodies and, uh, and putting the fear of God, pardon my expression, in, uh, into uh, some of the leaders. A second um, uh, element here uh, was the uh, failure to see that uh, hardcore religious right people had seized a significant part of the communications uh, infrastructure. That is to say, enormous organizations like the Trinity Broadcasting System while the, it's sometimes put this way, while the National Council of Churches and the old line denominations thought that a, a, a morning moment of meditation on Sunday morning on a, on a broadcast network was a big deal, the uh, right religious people were already involved in developing their cable networks and going to, you know, and then digital and so forth. I mean, the people who've been on the cutting edge of the technological revolution in communications have been pornographers and conservative Christians. So these things were demoralizing, and they set us back. Um, I do want to say that at this moment, because we want to focus on this moment, there is some good progressive religious work being done around immigration reform and gun violence. There is a uh, very robust good religion voice on LGBT issues without question now. There are some pretty productive and effective alliances with uh, low-wage worker campaigns here and there, not uh, entirely uh, unified. There are some stirrings, I'm involved in this myself, there are some stirrings of involvement in the emerging movements against racialized mass incarceration, the new Jim Crow, and obviously uh, environmental destruction. A lot of religious people involved with McKibben and, and 350.org on the Keystone stuff. I've been thinking in recent days, uh, it's, it's evident to me that the White House and the Democrats are going to try to uh, survive the midterm uh, period by uh, uh, running left on economic issues, running on inequality, running on minimum wage, running on the gender gap in employment, all of those issues. They've, they've got a package of 10 bills that uh, the Senate Democrats are going to try to push through, knowing none of them will become law. And the president, of course, knowing none of them will become law. To my way of thinking, uh, this uh, horrific new Gilded Age inequality um, ought to be sort of the persistent issue that religious progressives organizing, organize around, but we don't see nearly enough of it. It's almost as though instead of, uh, and James Lawson will use this expression, instead of being the headlight where the taillight and we allow the Democrats, and I include myself in this, we allow the Democrats to very cynically run on these issues knowing none of it will pass, to get the votes they need from working class people, and then they'll, and then they'll uh, run left and, and govern right, which is, the, which is the established pattern. You've seen it uh, again and again. And that, of course, 
you know, I try to talk to my other, my colleagues in the progressive religious movement about this, and they're very timid about wanting to have any daylight between them and the Democratic leadership. And I think that's a big problem, and I was, Sarah will say a little bit more about that. I think that the, the uh, whenever religious um, forces uh, allow themselves to be kept or manipulated uh, by uh, professional politicians, uh, we have a problem. Uh, some of us use the uh, expression faithiness. We have a, a faithiness industry, a, a religion industrial complex in Washington uh, that, that puts a, a sort of slight application of uh, God talk over what amounts to sort of commonplace uh, democratic initiatives. And people can smell that. They can see it and they can smell that and it doesn't get us very far. The other huge handicap we face is that uh, progressive philanthropists are afraid of religion and the only religion they'll fund is very closely tied to their own issue agenda. There's no, there's no deviation allowed. So these really aren't, aren't grants from foundations. They're more like performance contracts and they keep, uh, they keep religious leadership on a very short uh, uh, leash. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but there's a, a, over a 70 year now legacy of the Alinsky organizing in back of the yards in Chicago. It's called Faith-Based Community Organizing. These organizations are huge. They go by different names, PICO, Industrial Areas Foundation, Gamaliel. And there, too, there's this problem of, of a sort of kept agenda in that these organizations claim to be directed from the, from the bottom up by congregations that pay them dues. Uh, there's slight evidence that, in fact, they, they are uh, truly energized from below. They're mostly staff-directed. And, and the culture of every one of those organizations is that they don't tend to play well with others. They have to get their own brand out there. And so we have, very, we have difficulty bringing all of these forces together to create traction, to create real movement. Um, if it sounds like I'm making excuses for the religious left, I'm simply trying to uh, paint the landscape. And then I want to say uh, one additional thing. And here I, I need to name myself uh, as the first of sinners in a way. Um, religious progressives are as phobic about the malign aspects of religion, the sort of crazy aspects of religion, as everybody else is. Um, I, was, um, I had a procedure in, in a hospital yesterday, and a friend of mine who was a, a progressive Jewish leader, uh, and I both spotted a sign that said Atheists United at the same time, and we both said, ha, we're glad that they're out there, but do they think they're the, that they're the only ones? Right? And what she was saying is what, what I feel. I mean, within religious communities, there's a great deal of skepticism about, about religion, as there should be, um, as there should be. The consequence of that is people aren't leading from within the heart of the uh, progressives, often aren't leading from within the heart of the narrative of their own tradition. They're kind of dodging that out of their respect for the secular society and out of their queasiness about religious language itself. My thesis is um, that people are quite right to remain wary of, of aspects of religion that can sort of go, uh, go off the chart, so to speak, and yet progressive faith-based work loses half or more than half of its potential strength if it's not deeply grounded and bolstered by the most deeply held beliefs. I think we on the, on the religious left need to uh, uh, sort of get more comfortable with using religious language at the same time exercising care about that because apart from that, um, we, we stand vulnerable to the, to the relentless attacks of the right who say those guys are like every secular leftist out there. there, there there's no distinction except that they, they put a collar on because, you know, because if you're not um, able 
to, to do the framing within that tradition, whatever the tradition may be, uh, you uh, miss the connection with the, with the base. I would, um, I would say that um, uh, it ought to be the case in our civil society that secular reasons for doing the right thing, for having equitable uh, policies, should be sufficient and one shouldn't have to reach for uh, uh, religious rationale, and yet the consequence of not reaching into the religious community means that that community, which is significant. I mean, religious liberals number, and we can go through the numbers on this, but religious liberals in the United States are not an insubstantial group. There's over 25 million. There are 40 million conservative Christians, but there are 25 million religious progressives, certified religious progressives, mostly Christian, but other other flavors as well. That's not a small number of people, and yet that body remains relatively inert in respect to, the, to these great contentions that we face. So I look forward to the exchange, uh, and, uh, and I look forward in particular to, to uh, hearing from Sarah. Thank you, Peter. Sarah Posner is a contributing writer at Religion Dispatches and author of God's Prophets, that's Prophets, P-R-O-F-I-T-S, Faith, Fraud, and the Republican Crusade for Values. Her work has appeared in the American Prospect, The Nation, Salon, and the religion blogs at The Washington Post and The Guardian. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Posner. Thank you, Ian. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, so unlike Peter, I'm a, I'm a journalist, so I'm taking sort of a journalist's view on all of this, and I've reported on a lot of the things that he was talking about and a lot of the um, religious right and religious left movements. Um, and in starting out here, I think it's important to define, well, what do we mean by the religious left? Because I think that sometimes the way some people in the audience might conceptualize it is something different from the way the media often portrays it. Um, and when I think of the religious left, I think of a lot of the people that I've met along the way in doing my reporting. And some of those people include the former priest in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, who's now a community organizer and who questions what his church has really done to help the immigrants and the poor in his community, or the nun who used to work as an abortion clinic es escort or peacekeeper, as she liked to call it, and has long advocated for reproductive LGBT rights and women's ordination in the church or the conservative big C conservative rabbi who works with Americans for Peace Now, which advocates for an end to the Israel's occupation and a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Theologians who explain black liberation theology during the Jeremiah Wright brouhaha in 2008. Um, uh, the Presbyterian minister I met at Occupy Wall Street, um, a scruffy, frank-speaking advocate for the dispossessed, whose first question to me when I showed up um, at McPherson Square, where Occupy K Street was, to do some reporting there, and he said, where are all the clergy? Um, so what I think of what the religious left has done recently to mobilize as a, politi as a political movement, I think Peter um, might have made reference to this, um, is the Moral Mondays movement, which started in North Carolina um, as a protest against the extreme rightward shift of the state legislature there. Um, and it's starting to spread to other states. And it largely was a reaction to voter suppression uh, efforts at the state level there, but I think also is motivated by other uh, religious imperatives around issues like voting rights, which I mentioned, immigration, LGBT rights, reproductive rights, uh, economic inequality. And so uh, that for a lot of people has been a glimmer of hope that something's happening. There's also been a lot of discussion about how it's gotten so little media attention um, in comparison to, say, Tea Party protests. And uh, we can talk about this more in the Q&A, but when the media, I think what the media, and I'm a member of the media, obviously, but I'm talking sort of more broadly speaking, um, when it thinks of the religious left, it doesn't think about those people that I was just talking about but is talking about a different beast. It's sort of these advocacy organizations and political operatives inside the Beltway who have imagined themselves as a reaction to the religious right, which of course is a, you know, it's an understandable impulse, 
But these organizations and these people, generally speaking, are not really of the left. They're kind of more religious centrists. And they are, they've been very good at injecting a certain religious discourse into our politics, which I wouldn't call something, I wouldn't call it very left, but um, it can be a very sort of anodyne discussion of religion in our politics. Um, and I think it's found, this group has found itself in a sort of trap. It has to contest the religious rights claims um, to religious authenticity, um, but it lacks both the drive and the resources to contest that as vigorously as it needs to be contested. So on the drive question, the religious right, for the religious right, its worldview dictates every legislative and public policy question. And worldview, and this is a word that they use in a positive way, um, it hinges on a mix of biblical literalism and proof texting that predetermines every decision from the role of government to constitution, interpretation of the Constitution to individual rights to budgetary priorities. And the religious left, if it were true to its priorities, um, finds it caught, itself caught in a little bit of a tangle. It doesn't want the religion to pre, be the predeterminative governing principle or maybe it does, I don't know. Um, that's not always that clear. Um, but it faces, I think the left faces a lot of internal conflicts about whether to be more secular in terms of what it wants the government to do or have more religious talk in politics. Um, it's, you know, the religious left is up against something with which it profoundly disagrees uh, on both theological questions and political questions. Um, but unlike the religious right, the religious left, and I'm here I'm lumping in the centrists and the leftists uh, together, um, there are serious disagreements about the relationship between religion and politics and religion and governing, and those disagreements don't really exist on the right. And what's more, what's often defined as the religious left within political circles faces internal conflicts from its own left. <laughs> so, you know, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, for example, um, well, probably it's not fairly thought of as a left-leaning institution. I think it often has been thought of being left-leaning on issues like immigration reform and economic inequality. But despite its more moderate positions on those issues, it takes extreme right-wing issues on issues of reproductive, it's a right-wing stance on issues like reproductive rights and LGBT equality, and it faces intense dissent from within its own, the, own, the church, from within its own ranks. Um, yet because it's a lobby within Washington, it's seen as the voice of all Catholics, and so sometimes that gets all kind of lumped together. This is the religious left, it's, you know, it's difficult sometimes for uh, the media to sort out. Um, and it took about 30 years or so for the religious left, broadly speaking again, to realize that it had been stomped out of politics by the religious right. And by that time, the, the terms of political engagement with religion had already been defined by the religious right. Um, and so the religious left still struggles with what kind of political engagement does it want to have, um, and they struggle with should you know it be this sort of pablum religious talk in politics or do we even want to entangle religion uh, politicians in talking about religion? Um, will that alienate our constituents? What we've seen over the past several election cycles with the Democrats is I must talk about my religion to prove how religious I am, but I don't know how effective that is in terms of bringing in new voters. Um, so. Some crucial differences between the religious right and the religious left in terms of political organizing. The religious right has become an indispensable part of the GOP's get out the vote operation. Um, and uh, that's not true uh, for the Democrats. Um, the religious right maintains a very unholy alliance with the right's free market and Rand ring wing. Um, the religious right has no problem with Paul Ryan's budget, as was mentioned, um, and it probably has no problem with today's decision in McCutcheon. Both those things are seen as minimizing government intervention, which is also seen as a religious evil, and maximizing the free market, which frees up religious actors to influence elections more. Uh, so the Democrats lack that sort of homogenous constituency, either on religion or other demographic features. 
Um, so the Democratic religious outreach is kind of focused on the margins. Can we peel off a few voters who are white evangelicals but might not be so interested in the culture war issues anymore? Um, and the Democrats embrace the religious left when it's convenient. Um, one example is uh, they, uh, they seem to embrace the um, religious left's uh, advocacy for the contraception coverage requirement in the face of the protests from the right and the lawsuits from the right, which was actually, I thought, a, a pretty effective uh, way of using religion in politics. Um, so, but the religious left overall lacks the internal coherence, money, organization, drive. Peter mentioned the, the communications apparatus. There is no such thing on the left, and it works well, like I said, as a bulwark against the pronouncements of the religious right that amount to saying that fundamentalism is the only authentic religion, case in point, the contraception coverage. Um, but that, at bottom, was really a plea for the government to be neutral on religion, not for the government to favor one religion over another, which is good, which I think is great. Um, but this centrist lobby, I think, has, as I said, difficulty finding that balance of how much should uh, politicians talk about religion, how much should we demand that policy and law be undergirded by our religious beliefs instead of their religious beliefs, uh, or should it be undergirded by something else, like secular ideas, medical science in the case of the contraception coverage. Um, so I think that this inside the beltway religious leftish thing <laughs> is here to stay at least for a while. And I think that what you're gonna continue to see in the next few election cycles, if I were to predict these things, is uh, Democrats once again talking about their religion and wearing their religion on their sleeve. How much that is gonna translate into policy, it's hard to say. Um, but I think that in terms of the religious movements to watch that really emanate from the left, I think probably Moral Mondays is the one to watch. But I think it's too early to predict how that ultimately is going to succeed or not. So looking forward to the questions and answers. Let's, let's begin with the stealing Jesus question. The, the, the right has stolen Jesus. So do you try and convert the right to point out and, and make them see the light that they got it all wrong? Or do you try and build the religious left? I think the two are inseparable. Um, I, I, I did an experiment uh, around the issue of racialized mass incarceration in which I tried to uh, overcome my own sort of reluctance to go deep biblically and, and, uh, and did in fact uh, draw forth uh, eight different uh, claims about Jesus. Jesus, a lawbreaker himself, Jesus, the friend of lawbreakers, Jesus, uh, uh, the victim of mob violence and a, and a miscarriage of justice at his trial, uh, Jesus, the victim of uh, empire. Um, uh, and I made a, a big point of saying, and by the way, this is, uh, this is Jesus, but, but it's Jesus in complete uh, harmony with the Hebrew prophets, and and in in no way, I mean, in my in my view, Jesus didn't think of himself as a Christian. Not clearly, he 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 lived and died a, a, a committed Jew. Uh, it's important to remind today's Christian American Christians about that fact. Uh, but uh, you know, when I was c finished with it, I tried it out on a few clergy people, and they were thrilled. They were thrilled because it gives them these are more than talking points. It gives them really deep anchors to be speaking around uh, uh, mass incarceration. So I think, um, I think uh, you know, people in, in my world of progressive Christians have spent too much energy saying to the right, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. It sounds a bit whiny, right? It sounds a bit uh, disempowered. I think we just proceed forward to do our own exegesis, uh, uh, strong, Solid exegesis, um, and and uh, and not look backward. Yes, uh, Jesus was hijacked in the course of my lifetime. Certainly in our culture, Jesus was hijacked during the time of the Emperor Constantine as well. We have to remember this is a recurrent pattern. 
you can go back to the founding of, uh, of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and you have rival understandings of, of what this religion is about. In a, in, within a theocratic shell, you have some Puritan preachers uh, uh, saying that if you allow people to lend money at interest and if you allow the merchant class, the forming, the forming merchant class along the seaboard uh, to become wealthy, this completely destroys the commonwealth idea. This completely destroys their understanding of what a covenant community is about. And then you have the preachers who, who kind of stuck to the original idea uh, of the uh, of the uh, uh, Winthrop speech on the Arabella, right? The uh, the godly Commonwealth idea where we where we share and suffer together. So that contested thing about what is this religion about has been uh, has been a recurrent, recurrent, recurrent theme. You mentioned William Jennings Bryan. In some ways, we lost the the we lost the battle when Bryan appeared at the Scopes trial, and you know this story, right? And made a fool of himself, right? Because um, it, it, you know, we, we, you know, we're not we're not good at this. He was a he was a brilliant, as you say, populist hero. Uh, and when I read his uh, speeches today, I get goosebumps at how good he was at incorporating you know go- the gospel in this stuff. Uh, and then he goes and makes a fool of himself. And the 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 right never got over the humiliation of that. In some ways, today's religious right goes all the way back to 1923. But let's not get historical. <laughs> well, I think we can't we can't avoid the history because maybe it's in the DNA. Um, you know, I'm from Australia, and people always say, "Oh, you're descended from a convict," and which which I reply, "Well, you guys are descended from religious fanatics." You know, <laughs> so take your pick. <laughs> but you know, Th- Thomas Paine, who was the intellectual spark of the revolution in many ways. He was an atheist, and he died a pauper, and he was shunned by the rest of his revolutionaries. And he made one of his many great statements was that belief in a cruel God makes a cruel man. And, and you do feel that, that this is deep in the DNA, this kind of fire and brimstone stuff. So is, it, is, that, is that a fact? And, and is, is yes. So... <laughs> In that, in terms of that forty percent that Peter was talking about, as opposed to the the twenty five percent Christian light, as opposed million. to Christian dark, uh, what do you think? How much of the forty percent? Well, th- okay, I think there. I, I agree that this is a strain in American religious life that will probably never go away. I mean, you hear a lot of pronouncements now that, you know, there's this polling data on Americans becoming less religious and they're less affiliated with organized religion, if not totally atheist. Um, But I think that there has always been and there always will be a conservative, fundamentalist, literalist, whatever you want to call it, strain in American Christianity that is very motivated um, has a lot of drive, as I mentioned, right now has a lot of money, and has managed to make this very convenient uh, political alliance that forms the Republican Party with free market and, and uh, national security conservatives um, that has fit very well together for them. Some of that may be fracturing a little bit with the Ron Paul revolution, but there's still a religious component there. Uh and so you may have 40 million white evangelicals available to come out and vote versus 25 million uh, mainline Protestants. I don't, I don't know that those numbers are determinative of anything, but I do think that the numbers that actually come out to vote are. And evangelicals vote in high numbers because I think part of the message to them is... Uh, very dire. I think that that may be something that the left lacks, you know, that God will punish America. You know, there's a very sort of judgmental God if if we allow abortion or we allow gay marriage or whatever the issue is. Um, and this is your moment, your moment, your Esther moment to uh, save America from all these evil things. And so you have to go out and vote. Your vote matters very much. Um, you know, it's not it's not a throwaway vote. It's it's a crucial time. It's always a crucial time. You know, now is the time where America will be is at a crossroads. So um, I think that motivation factor is very very strong. And even when they 
don't succeed. For example, you know, Obama was elected twice, so they didn't succeed, but they nonetheless succeed in altering our, our politics, even if they don't determine the outcome of every election. So if indeed this uh, Hillary Clinton, and I'm certainly <laughs> not quoting her, I mean, uh, I'm doing it reluctantly, I shall say. Um, she's recently at the University of uh, Arizona said to the student body that global warming will become the defining issue of our time and you students should get behind and create a movement. And I think it's reasonable to assume that that will happen because there's no question of the science and the fact that we're heading in, in a direction and, and now that the UN panel is talking about mitigating and adapting, not even talking about trying to stop it. You know, it's too far gone to stop. So it's a reality. So how do you think that's going to affect things? Will the fundamentalists f feel that uh, Noah's Ark 2, the sequel, is, head is heading our way? Uh, or will the, you know, Christians go green, wake up and recognize that they're stewards of this planet? Uh, that's an excellent question. I I think uh, there may be, I wouldn't call it a breakout f uh, for uh, progressive religion around this, but but at least um, uh, an opportunity to do good. And the, and the, and the difference here is uh, most on the religious right, uh, uh, they may not be climate change deniers, but they're, but they're dominionists and they're also, um, they're also uh, uh, God will provide, right? God will provide interplanetary travel. Whatever is required, <laughs> deliverance will, will come. No, I'm serious. I, you know, uh, read their stuff. It, it, it describes that. Progressive religious people say Earth is our only home and we've, and we've contaminated it. Uh, I actually think that the role for, um, for uh, progressive religious people is not so much going green. I'm constantly arguing with clergy, clergy colleagues of mine saying, solarize your goddamn church roof if you want, but, you know, and drive your Prius. But the real issue you've got to face up with is the ethical issue when people don't have food, right? Uh, 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 congregations, churches are, are going to be one of the few independent uh, institutions out there with a capacity to sort of help in a, um, in a uh, sort of nightmarish scenario, which, which is not any longer, I agree with you about the, about the UN panel report, this is not uh, a future development. I mean, this is, this is going to be happening very, very quickly. Of course, the rich countries in the U.S. will be spared the worst for a while, but there, but there already was very recently uh, a huge spike in food prices for basic commodities that, that uh, a fifth of our, uh, our fellow Americans have to consume uh, because of all of the use of uh, corn products for making ethanol, something completely useless and beside the point that actually consumes more fossil energy than, than uh, it produces. Um, I think the role is going to be a, a, a very interesting one. I think it's going to be like the city of refuge role, which churches haven't played for a long, long time, if they will understand that that's their ethical responsibility. I'm not, by the way, against solarizing the roof, but it's, it's, uh, it's sort of peripheral to the main struggle right now. So, Sarah, when, when you t attend the Christian right events and interview Christian right leaders and stuff like that that you do, um, I'm really kind of curious to try and figure out uh, how in, in, in uh, you know, they, they can maintain this idea that they're not like the Taliban. I mean, here we are with this war on terror. Seriously, I mean, it sounds pejorative, but, <laughs> and I, it probably is, but <laughs> I'll qualify it. <laughs> uh, you know, many are like, they are dominionists in many ways. They, they, they believe that uh, we should be a theocracy. I mean, uh, I can, Forwell, Robinson, they all say that. Well, and, that, and we are, we've had a lot of trouble with theocrats in Af Afghanistan in particular. Right. Well, I, I, you know, I know that there's a, a tendency to try to draw that comparison. The, the American Taliban, I think, is the title of a book that somebody wrote. Uh, but I sort of resist that comparison because I just don't think it helps explain what the religious right in the United States really is about. Because I think it conjures up 
images of no, but I wasn't violence that against way. the I was populace that I, know, <laughs> I don't think is when, part of the agenda. If you ever bring it up with them, that there's an uncomfortable similarity between your doctrine and the doctrine of this enemy of ours, alleged enemy in the war on terror. <laughs> Well, I've never asked anybody that question. Oh, no. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that what they're, they are looking for a government that is run by what they might call a biblical worldview or biblical values or Judeo-Christian values. Or, you know, these are all interchangeable terms for what they want. And they, this hinges on their, it's hinged on their idea that the separation of church and state is a myth that it was created by activist judges in the 20th century and it was never intended by the founders and that it was the invention of, you know, evil secular liberals, basically, and that they're aiming to restore the United States to what the founders intended for it to be like. And, you know, so I think a lot of people, you know, Peter referenced the Scopes trial. I think a lot of people think that maybe Roe versus Wade was the launch of the religious right. But you can also look at 1962 and 1963 in the Supreme Court decisions invalidating uh, mandatory Bible reading and mandatory school prayer right. in public schools um, as being one of the other launches of the religious right. This is something that they've never gotten over. I mean, if you, you they still, to this day, they want to restore prayer in public schools. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't equate it mm -hmm. to the Taliban, but these are you know, these are what they're, right. they're quite, you know, upfront about it, what their goals are. Well, in, to that regard, though, Peter, haven't, haven't liberals and secularists been, you know, somewhat rigid and unimaginative? For example, to my mind, the best way to, to assuage people who are upset that, that, that you don't do prayer in school anymore it would be to, to teach comparative religion, mm -hmm. to teach the whole menu of religion, uh, that way, because all religions, their first, uh, the first edict is we're the only true religion. Right. That's number one. So to me, it's a it's a very subversive and, and educational way to both show the full spectrum of faith, and people can pick and choose that we are, after all, a free country. Except that the right wouldn't buy that bargain at all because uh, there is no comparative religion as you say right so uh, uh, it's 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 uh, it's our flavor it's our way or the highway uh, I mean we we have uh, progressives have proposed that approach many many uh, mm -hmm. times there there are people in um, in religiously affiliated college colleges who uh, uh, come into courses on the Bible as literature and they're completely at sea, they're they're hopelessly panicked. They have a panic attack because that is completely unlike uh, the way they've been introduced to to the to the Bible. I mean, the Bible is a a rule book and a source of real information. It's not a collection of ancient manuscripts that don't agree with one another. They just can't stand that, and they can't stand they 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 feel the poetry in the Bible, but they refuse to call it poetry. Um, I want to just amend a little bit uh, what you said, Sarah. I think the school prayer decisions, but famously the desegregation yes. of Bob Jones University. I mean, I actually think it wasn't women's reproductive health and it wasn't school prayer. It was race. It well, was, and I still think it's race that keeps the, the white religious right going. Uh, Randall Balmer's account right. of the rise of the religious right um, documents that very thing, um, how... Uh, Paul Weyrich and others when they were forming the political apparatus of the, what we now know as the religious right in the early 1970s, they were looking for an issue that was going to get these evangelical ministers and leaders motivated. And abortion was not the thing that was getting them motivated at all. But um, the revocation of Bob Jones University's tax-exempt status right. because of its uh, interracial uh, no race mixing. Dating no ban. race mixing. Right. Yeah. Um, that, was, that was seen as undue government interference with the Christian schools and the church and so on. And you hear echoes of that today in their ginned up controversy about the IRS suppressing the free speech of the groups that applied for a 501c3 and c4 status and so on. You hear echoes of that 
that era in terms of like the IRS is this terrible behemoth that is interfering with the uh, we good Christians and what we're doing. Free exercise, right. Well, let's take qu questions here. We have microphones on both sides. And uh, uh, Mr. Larman, would you would you amplify your <coughs> your thought <coughs> as being that race is a motivation of the religious right? Uh, would you amplify that uh, statement, please? Sure. Um, um, the um, the fact that um, that the segregationists uh, lost and lost massively uh, as a result of, uh, of court action at the federal level and then uh, congressional action behind that uh, left uh, people who were uh, uh, committed to, a, to, to racial separation in a, in a, in a wounded state. Uh, and when they could make the claim that uh, the, the religious autonomy of a religious institution, in the case of Bob Jones University, but there were some others as well, was being violated by uh, uh, the rescinding of the, of the tax exemption, the heavy hand forcing race mixing in a Christian institution, that was trouble. The other, the other trend uh, that was evident all through the South in the wake of school desegregation is these Christian academies, uh, 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 not always identified as Christian academies, but in, in essence they were segregated institutions. That this, uh, so the public schools were taken away from them, so they had to form their own, uh, own schools separately. I think you can't separate the thread of racism from the uh, uh, resentment of the Christian right in the United States, and resentment is the mother's milk of of the Christian right. This sense, no matter no matter how many victories they rack up legislatively or otherwise, they're always the victims. Always the victims of, you know, a giant left liberal secular conspiracy to to rub out um, uh, their their uh, uh, freedom to, to uh, practice their relief. They, they, they confuse, they confuse uh, religious freedom with um, uh, religious domination. To them, they're one and the same thing, and that's a problem. There's I a may have further confused you, but... There was a book written by uh, Rush Limbaugh's brother that was all about the idea that Christians are persecuted in this country, right. which is a little hard to swallow when you compared to the rest of the world. Uh, some more questions? Yes, the gentleman up there on the... Right, right here. Um, I have a question. Traditionally, the black churches have been progressive, and then recently, with a lot of LGBT activism, it seems like maybe they're less progressive. Do you think that that is playing a role at all in the issues we're talking about tonight? Well, here in California, we can document the way in which uh, 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 black church leaders were recruited, actually actively recruited by white conservatives to, um, to, to begin to speak out um, on the Prop 8 controversy and since that, since that time. I think it's a terrible libel, however, to say that, um, that uh, Prop 8 uh, owes its success to uh, uh, Black voters in California. Black voters in Calif Black people in California are 6.6 percent of the population, um, and I I I I got very uh, agitated when I heard some of my I'm a I'm a gay person myself. When I heard some of my colleagues uh, in the LGBT movement uh, talk about, well, you know, the Black Church did us in. It 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 is a problem, but it's a problem that is is uh, uh, mellowing at this point. I think it's a. I think it's a shame to uh, to uh, 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 do that and put a blanket judgment on black church uh, leaders on this issue, especially now. I think that there was someone. I can't remember his name. But someone at NYU did a study after Prop Eight and found that the uh, statistically speaking, that the uh, it was a attributing canard. it, it was to a it was a canard. Um, and I think that the. I mean, there are plenty of. Uh, 
uh, black ministers um, who are for marriage equality and for LGBT rights. And so I think pe people tend to overstate that. But I think even so, I don't think that it has really stood in the way of uh, black churches forming alliances with other pro um, marriage equality uh, religious organizations on other issues. I don't think that anybody, I, I have not heard of uh, that standing in the way of, of alliances on economic issues or, or what have you. Well, and you mentioned uh, Moral Mondays and Bill Barber. Right. I mean, Bill Barber has said from the very beginning of this, everybody's welcome. Um, and he's I don't, the, I don't right. know if, how many of you have ever heard of uh, Carter Hayward. She was uh, one of the first women ordained to the priesthood in the Episcopal Church. She's an out lesbian professor of theology. She is now the head of a NAACP chapter in rural North Carolina where she lives. And she's welcomed, and th that's all working well. I think the more serious issue with the black church today is not um, homophobia. I think it's the prosperity gospel, um, which um, which is a contest right here in L.A. between the, uh, a, a strong element of black church leadership that understands that's a fatal path to go on, that is to say God will bless you and make you rich. You should be rich. Right? It's the black version of Joel Osteen. Um, and the people who are who are completely into that, right? Um, because it sells. I mean, it sells. Desperate people want to think that there's a kind of magic. If you go to church and follow the rules, you'll get money. I have a question about the religion and the campus. Uh, I was a product of Cornell United religious work in the anti-war movement, okay. at which point there were Catholic leaders, the Barrigans, et cetera, and a largely Jewish membership or an overrepresented Jewish membership. And I'm just wondering um, where, where is Catholicism in this discussion? Um, where is the Hispanic population? And, uh, and where is the campus? If you could sort of address those missing issues. On, on questions of what, on what issues in particular? Progressive or non-progressive religion politics. Oh, just broadly speaking, not on any. Okay. Well, I'll sure. take the, I'll take the Catholic Church part of your question. I don't know if I have any uh, any knowledge on which to base an answer on the campus question, um, not having really been affiliated with the campus in quite some time. Um, but you know, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, as I mentioned when I was speaking, um, they. I think for a long time, obviously, you know, Catholics have long played a role in uh, progressive religion in the United States. But the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, which claims to represent all American Catholics and is seen as representing all American Catholics, say, on Capitol Hill, um, is a conservative institution. And I think that, you know, people are obviously looking to Pope Francis um, to uh, bring the church into a uh, it, what some people might say as its more traditional uh, position on a lot of these issues, but he has little uh, power to force the U.S. bishops out of their political position. I mean, part of what he's saying also is that the bishops have a lot of leeway to decide their, you know, their local issues, their local issues being issues of American politics. So it's going to take some time and Pope Francis is going to have to live for a long time to appoint new bishops that might suit his, his mold a little bit more um, for the U S conference of Catholic bishops to not be um, a conservative institution. Now that's not to say that there aren't loads of progressive Catholics in this country and progressive Catholics who are involved with uh, religious progressive religious organizations and, and things like that. Um, but again, it's a question of, organizing and money and um, and being seen by the media and by politicians as being representative of who they, you know, of, of Catholics. But why did the media almost boycott what just happened over the weekend with the Catholic bishops going to the Mexican border and celebrating a mass to commemorate the 6,000 Mexicans who've died coming into the United States? Did the media boycott that? I didn't see it anyway. I okay. mean, maybe, maybe some people have questions. Yeah, I mean, I guess because I, I, I saw I, it, but it but at the yeah. bottom of columns. 
Right, right. You know, that this I think this is an issue. I'm like I'm saying, you know, I don't think the US bishops are uniformly conservative on things and immigration reform is one of the things that they've taken a positive stance on. But why do they get more attention for opposing abortion and opposing opposing contraception than going to the border and having this mass uh, over immigration? And I, I wish I could answer that question. I've, I've, I've actually written about this, about when religious groups do something like that. There was recently a gun violence prevention Sabbath that was interfaith, different groups participating in that. It got literally no uh, media coverage. And there was a big discussion among religion journalists about why why this is. And, and I, you know, it's a, it's a question of, you know, what makes for the editors and what makes good copy um you know often stories are fueled by conflict goods what they think of as good stories are fueled by conflict um you need some really you know juicy hook i guess not that many uh news outlets have a reporter down at the border i mean to be totally honest Mm -hmm. uh also um although i do believe that I'm pretty sure that uh, John Allen, who's the who's covers the church for now for the Boston Globe, was there. I'm pretty sure he must have written about it. So, um, you know, I think that that's that is continually a really difficult mm-hmm. issue because I think that the media, and when I say the media, I don't mean you know religion reporters because obviously religion reporters cover a lot of this stuff, but just more broadly speaking, it, why does it not draw their interest? And I think that that is a question that the media has to ask itself, but I think also um, progressive religious people have to also ask themselves, and this is probably anathema to them, but do we have a good media strategy? Right. Well, of course, religion, right, is there only one step up from those who write the obituaries, right? <laughs> Regrettably. <laughs> it's kind of a graveyard for one, one step down. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Any more questions here? Yes, over here on the right here. I wonder if you agree that uh, perhaps this is, uh, as I've heard some people say, uh, part two of the Civil War. There are really two visions here, Mm -hmm. and one has always been liberal and one has always been conservative. Say what you will about the Puritans. They they made their mistakes, but they were always at the forefront of of liberal thought. They... uh, they uh, pioneered democracy, for example. They pioneered capitalism. So they were liberal um, in their day and age. Oh, and I would say that they, why were they liberal? Because they were educated. And the, the South has a very different uh, tradition. Right. I, I think uh, uh, Marilyn Robinson's essays uh, uh, make this unmistakably clear. She, she does not... Uh, she does not demonize John Calvin. She thinks the, the contributions of the New England settlement were were uh, uh, positive. I do think there is this there is this um, bifurcation in our culture: uh, uh, Roundheads and Cavaliers in the English Civil War. Um, actually, um, uh, uh, Kevin, help me, Ian. Kevin. Uh, who writes about everything? Uh, the guy who was Nixon's Southern strategy guy, Kevin oh, Phillips. 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 Kevin yeah. Phillips mm-hmm. wrote a wonderful book about this, in which he in which he drew forth the English Civil War, the uh, American uh, Revolution, and the uh, and the American Civil War, and found common threads uh, through all of them. Uh, the idea of the hard drinking, violent, patriarchal figure. Uh, who controls other people's bodies, women's bodies, and the bodies of uh, chattel, slaves, uh, has never uh, gone away in the South. And interestingly, that, that idea has also been fused with an idea of Christian chivalry, which the, you know, these are sort of irreconcilables, but it's been done. Um, uh, the, the problem, though, with the, with the Northern legacy, uh, and I, I can never quite get over this is that um, uh, Amos Lawrence, for example, who provided uh, uh, rifles to the abolitionists in Kansas, in bloody Kansas, uh, and his compatriots who were uh, significant leaders of the abolitionist movement were capitalists who were absolutely brutal on 
sub subjugating their, uh, in, the, you know, in the early industrial period, subjugating their uh, own workers. And so there's always been this uh, tension among our Puritan uh, inheritors between a very clear commitment to racial equality but, but a, a very muddied commitment to economic equality, and that, that persists as well in our culture. This is to uh, both panelists. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts about the uh, fraternization uh, between the religious right and the Israeli Jews, or those Jews in this country who are uh, very close? Christian Zionists, I think, called. Yeah, I, I, um, I think it's probably uh, impossible to overstate the significance of the influence of Christian Zionists on, on U.S. foreign policy. I think they provide a very important buttress, especially at moments like this where the stakes are very high and these peace talks are about to fall apart. Uh, and why is that? And of course the big puzzle is why, why do uh, observant Jews accept this? Because the, these Christians are all, without exception, supersessionists. In other words, they would like Israel to control all of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount as a, as a uh, uh, precondition to Christ returning and establishing earthly rule and wiping out the Jews. Right? Except for 144,000. Yeah, I mean, it's a very not, not much of a deal. It's mm. not always the case that you know, mm. uh, uh, the, you know, the uh, enemy of your enemies are, are your friends, right? I just, I, you know, it, it's it's cynical on both sides. The American Christian Zionists are absolutely sincere in this. The amount of money that they control is is enormous. A lot of it is from Texas. A lot of it is from Arizona. It's not small potatoes at all. Um, this, by the way, talk about invisible stories in the, in the corporate media. That's just not there at all. The gentleman there in the middle. I just want, want oh, to sorry. add one thing. Uh, I've written Come about this a lot. Um, and uh, it's very, in the Jewish community, this relationship is actually quite controversial. You know, I think that there are a lot of uh, right-wing American Jews who are, you know, basically, you know, support Netanyahu, who, n not universally, but that would, you know, welcome the su what they consider to be support for Israel from any quarter. But I think among American Jews, broadly speaking, the alliance with the Christian Zionists is very controversial, not just because of their Christian Zionist views on Israel, but because they are, their domestic policies. You know, this is basically the American Christian right, so it's very much at odds with the majority of American Jews' views on domestic issues as well. Yeah, I just had a question about the uh, statistic, 25 million uh, religious progressives and 40 million, you know, religious conservatives. What, I mean, how's that defined? Like, how's a religious progressive defined? I, I use those numbers, so I need to be very careful. And, and uh, Sarah, at one point you said mainline Protestants. No, mainline Protestants are about 15 million at this point. The, way, the only way you get to 25, the, the, the 40 million committed white evangelicals is, uh, is undisputed by anybody. The way you get to 25 on the other side is by adding in the people we call graduates. That is to say, they've sort of stopped going to church because church is boring, but that doesn't mean that they're not interested and committed to the figure of Jesus. There are a lot of them out there. It includes, um, it includes uh, Quakers, Unitarians. It includes uh, a lot of uh, people who are spiritual but not religious, but whose politics are progressive. That's how you get to 25 million. You can't, you can't do it on the basis of traditional church-going uh, uh, folk, and of course, uh, uh, progressive Muslims. I mean, it's it, uh, I I will uh, make available to the curators of this program the the Robbie Jones thing on how you count how you count people. Now, of course, that degree of fragmentation on the progressive side obviously lessens our capacity to to do anything with a common voice. But I keep hearing the statistic that thirty five percent of Americans believe that the earth was created uh, uh, you know, 6,000 years ago. Is that 
Is that an accurate figure? Well, I, that doesn't you know, gel with 40 percent. Well, I suppose it does, doesn't it? My friend Bill McKibben likes to say that uh, a very significant number of Americans think that uh, Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. <laughs> He he wrote an he wrote an essay which uh, he he wrote for a book that I edited, and he called the the essay was brilliantly titled, "The People of the Unread Book," and his point was they wave the Bible kind of you know fetishistically at their rallies and stuff, but they actually uh, don't read it. Um, I, you know I I I try to I recoil and I try to stay away from factoids like the one you just raised, Mr. Masters. Mm -hmm. They might, this, you no, call no, it this, recoiling. This, I put uh, it. I call it putting your head in the sand. <laughs> Go ahead. Hey, thanks a lot. Um, two words I like to hear in a discussion like this is moral high ground. And um, being as the gospels are so heavily weighted towards compassion for the underclass and human rights, even the environment, how can we show them the light? <sighs> Praise the Lord. Well. <laughs> Uh, I, here's, 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 a, here's something that's not widely discussed. In, um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm speaking of the, of the groups I'm most familiar with. In uh, Protestant church life, uh, and, and I, you know, I was involved in doing some studies about this, um, there is a fairly sharp divide between the views of the clergy, the views of the ministers, and the views of the laity, in that the in that the uh, ministers are significantly more progressive. What inhibits them from um, opening up, so to speak, to the full-bodied liberative gospel? It's the fear of being fired. It's it comes down to that. I mean, the the congregations in in most of these denominations call their ministers. And the ministers are accountable to the congregation. I mean, I served a very liberal church in New York, but I must say that uh, every year I, my contract was, was renewed by vote of the congregation, right? You know, you're, you're kind of at their disposal, so to speak. A lot of people pull their punches and mute their voices for, for that very reason. There are people within congregations, we call them sleeper cells. They're people who don't say very much. They're probably big donors, you know, they make a big pledge, uh, but if the minister gets afoul of them, you know, the people, people in the congregation have conversations among themselves, and before too long, that minister is without, without a job. That's a, that's a problem. Uh, and the other is, I think there's a, um, a very foolish professional sense of what's appropriate. That is to say, um, I am not permitted, many clergy say this, I'm not permitted to have a public voice outside of my immediate uh, charge. Um, that's uh, uh, contrary to, I think, what the, the best tradition of uh, religious leadership in the United States, but it's still uh, real. There's this uh, domestication of the clergy, which is, a, which is a problem. I don't mean to be all doom and gloom here. I think um, the makeup of the, of the clergy is changing. I think some of the inhibited ones are about ready to retire. Uh, I think some more fearless ones may come in. I don't really care what happens to the institutional churches per se. What I care about is the the movement, the juice, the you know the the heart, uh, and I think that can that can persist in in new forms and will persist in new forms. So I don't think that the religious right um, at the grassroots has. Uh, I think it does understand the imperatives to uh, the Christian imperatives to help the poor. They just have a very different conceptualization of how that happens. Um, so they don't really believe in a government social safety net, for example, and they believe instead that this should be done by Christian charity. But the limits of that, I think, were demonstrated a little bit in the last couple of weeks when uh, World Vision, which is one of the biggest evangelical, it's one of the biggest humanitarian charities in the world, and it's one of the biggest evangelical ones, um, announced a change in its employment policy, whereby they said if you're gay or lesbian and you're living in a state that has legal same-sex marriage and you're married, we will now hire you, whereas before they would not. Um, and this provoked such... Is this something people heard about? Is this something that, yeah. It was okay. front page. Um, front page. And uh, 
the the outrage from evangelicals was so intense that they within a day or two that they had they had backtracked. So, um, you know, I guess the uh, helping the poor comes with certain conditions. <laughs> I just have a question. I we've been discussing the religious left and the religious right, and how effective can a religious left be to counteract all of this implementation that's been happening state by state of women's rights and women's health and clinics being closed? And so what is the, what's, how can a religious left be effective? What is it that you're actually doing that could counteract all of these things? Well, I think there's a very simple narrative, and I try to get my, my colleagues in religious leadership to use it, which is um, uh, the equal moral discernment of men and women, uh, so foundational to uh, the fact that, uh, that the, you know, the Genesis accounts for people who are biblical literalists show very clearly that, that, that uh, human beings were made equally from the beginning and, have, and, and share equally in moral discernment. And so for men to make decisions about women's bodies is, a, is just uh, uh, anathema in respect to that foundational dignity. Uh, now, that doesn't mean there's not misogyny in the Bible and so forth, but at a basic level, and of course, Jesus granted women complete uh, moral discretion in a way that got him in big trouble uh, by, by making friends of women in an honor society where women were diminished. The, the, the interesting thing, though, here is many of the clergy who have been willing to uh, step out a little bit on LGBT stuff still can't quite get to the point to be, to be powerful, powerfully allied with uh, women's reproductive health. But well, you, you mentioned somebody, that a, a nun down in Arizona, wasn't it? Well, so that was well. No, this nun is in Illinois. Illinois, okay. But you know, so she's with the National Coalition of American Nuns, which has been under investigation by the Vatican for heresy. And mm-hmm. everybody talks about Pope Francis ushering in this new era. Well, they're still under investigation for heresy. But to your question about the, uh, just let's just take the abortion restrictions in the states as an example. I mean, this is evidence that the real action is at the state level right now not at the national level. They don't have, I mean, Congress can't do anything and they're not going to pass anything remotely as uh, aggressive or or, um, uh, repressive as what they're attempting and in some cases succeeding at at the state level. And here's an example, I think, of this divergence between the two religious lefts that I talked about in my remarks. So there's the religious left that's robustly for um, women's reproductive rights. And then there's this kind of mushy middle that's like inside the beltway and tries to, um, you know, shape the contours of the discussion of faith and politics. And I was covering the emergence of some of these organizations in, you know, after the 2004 election, which was when they started to crop up because they felt like John Kerry didn't talk about his religion enough and that's why he lost. Um, That's a different issue. Um, But one of the things that they emphasized, these inside the Beltway organizations, was let's try to find common ground on abortion. We want to end the culture wars. We don't want to fight with the religious right anymore. And they came up with all these proposals to find common ground on abortion. Meanwhile, you know, anti-choice organizations were mobilizing and getting this model legislation drafted. And then it, you know, so so you were trying to find the common ground got you. So, um, you know, I think to me that was an object lesson in how well the religious right organizes, how trying to find this mushy middle on some of these contested issues doesn't really work because they don't want to find common ground with liberals on abortion. They want to end legal abortion. And so once you take that seriously and if you want to contest that from a religious standpoint as opposed to a secular standpoint, um, then you need the 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 voices of that religious perspective to uh, have uh, have credence. And I just think that the way the abortion question has been framed, I think there's a very small, relatively small number of, of people, of religious people who will actively advocate for it. I do think that the 
aggressiveness of these state restrictions has emboldened more of these activists. So I think, you know, the reproduct, uh, the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, the Religious Institute in Connecticut, some of these organizations have stepped up um, making um, religious arguments in favor of choice. Um, but they're not as, they're not as, these groups are not as cohesive and driven and well-funded as the anti-abortion groups on the right. No, and it would take a lot more than just the, these um, making religious arguments because that's basically an argument of don't impose, there are, the Americans differ in their religious views on abortion, so you can't impose this one religious view of abortion. So it's basically an argument for, for, for a secular view of the law. Well, we've reached the witching hour, but we'll just take one quick qu question. I'll try to, I'll try to make it quick. Um, so the re religious right is predated by um, liberation theology, and you could actually make an uh, argument that the religious right is almost an astroturf movement. But uh, Pope Francis met with Father Gutierrez last fall, who wrote towards a um, theology of liberation. And have either of you, um, Mr. Larman or Ms. Posner, seen any institutional changes towards that that he's been able to enact? And, and then a uh, second is, I also understand that as he cleans house bureaucratically, he's going to move women into um, bureaucratic positions in the Vatican. Do, can either of you comment on, on either of those? I'm Chief. sure he'll do the latter. Uh, on the liberational, uh, liberationist uh, tip, liberation theology, uh, he, he met as a gesture, uh, but liber liberation theology uh, is still anathema in Catholic doctrinal circles. They, they have turned their back decisively against that. Now, it exists very strongly within the laity, right, in many, many countries, but officially it's, it's the, the protection of the church for that has been withdrawn. It was way too closely identified with, quote, unquote, Marxism for their liking. Um, and on the women's issue, he's very clearly stated that women's ordination is off the table, but he has indicated, and I think he already has um, installed some women in, in bureaucratic lay positions. But um, within, you know, there's the women's ordination issue himself. He said that door door is closed. And Sarah, you said he'd have to live a long time to uh, to actually change the uh, College of Cardinals. He's 78, right? The same. Well, God works in many mysterious ways. <laughs> so I thank both of you for coming tonight. Thank you, Ian. Join me in thanking them. Too.